been here. I've been here basically every day for the past two weeks. Yeah, I'm going to. I got that on on tape. This is where I take time to remind this august body of journalists and photojournalists to turn off all cell phones, pagers, camera speakers, bureau phones, space eaters, microwave ovens. How about a Mr. Megaphone? I need one. That's good. That's good for the August ones. What about the September ones? We have to turn off our tasers? <laughs> You go up the turnpike. Um, you go, you go. Uh, I'm trying to think the easiest way. Shopping. The way that oh. I do it. Oh. Do you live in Maryland or Virginia? But I just go. You go up ninety-five. Um, the way that I do it, I, I, I go to get off, get off on ninety-five, and then there's uh, the yeah. name of the street yeah. is. Yeah. 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 I'm sure they have. It's, it's, it's north. It's yeah, I'd say a little bit over two hours. 
But I mean, up on the bottom here, so it's like a little bit around here. Here you are, you're scooting away. I mean, the rule of him is no sense of laziness. Because he'll ask you to attack each other. So from Germantown, about an hour and a half. Cool, well, that's Yeah, otherwise, or otherwise, they're notably unhelpful. This is kind of but we don't want to take a word last call to hang around with the Absolutely. And if you're into iron and further that one you want to do. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for our third briefing of the day. Uh, this afternoon, we have the Deputy Commander of U.S. Central Command here. Uh, Lieutenant General Lance Smith, who many of you know and who we have seen by uh, the miracles of modern technology on our video screen up here. But he was in town and uh, he's agreed to give us some time this afternoon to give you a, a current uh, situational update in theater. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, sir. Thank you. A afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here. It, it really is. Sometimes this is the only opportunity we get to see our families and uh, so I'm back for a week and had to come up to the city and uh, testify before the Senate Armed Services Committee and gives us a chance to go over and visit the other agencies as we go through the, the difficult things and challenging things we're doing over in our in our region uh, so I'm I'm pleased to be here and and I look forward to the questions after this I, I first of all like to start out uh, saying uh, you know condolences to to all those families and family members of uh, coalition uh, members and, uh, and Iraqis that, uh, that lost uh, family members in the, in the recent operations out there, uh, of which there, uh, there were a number uh, of ongoing. This, uh, the Fallujah operation was uh, very successful, but uh, it uh, had a price, and, uh, and uh, all of our thoughts are with the loved ones that, uh, that, that were lost there. Uh, we, we are very pleased with the uh, operations in Fallujah. Uh, it happened the way uh, it was planned. Uh, it was swift. Uh, there was overwhelming firepower that was uh, put in the right place at the right time. And uh, I, I wouldn't uh, say that we, we are in mopping up operations. That sounds like uh, nothing's going on. There are some, uh, there's some intense fighting still going on. Uh, in some pockets in, in Fallujah, and, uh, and we will continue until those, uh, those pockets are gone. Uh, it looks like the, these are, are some of the uh, jihadists. Uh, we're not sure whether they're foreign fighters or local, but, but uh, what we see from them is uh, the, the type of people that are there prepared to, to fight to the very last. Uh, some of them have uh, explosive vests. Uh, that they're fighting with that will, uh, as our soldiers go into the buildings or wherever they are, we, we expect that they'll blow themselves up uh, to cause uh, further, further casualties. So we are slowly working ourselves uh, through those, uh, those limited areas where we uh, still are. Uh, we're going to find uh, continued evidence, we think, uh, that we've dis severely disrupted the insurgents' game plan. Uh, as we go back and take a look at the exploitation of what we've, what we've done. As you know, we went through the city um, house by house. We are now going back and relooking at some of the areas we've been uh, to make sure that we're, we're capturing all the information that's available uh, out there. Uh, there are some interesting things that have come out of this, uh, uh, this fight, and, and I, will, I will read some of them to you. In, in one sector of Fallujah, uh, one unit uncovered 91 weapons caches and 431 improvised explosive devices uh, over the last 10 days. 
in, in contrast to that, the entire uh, Marine Expeditionary Force found 48 caches and 93 IEDs in the month of October. And in, and in all of Iraq in the month of October, units found 130 caches and destroyed 348 IEDs. So that is an incredibly significant amount of uh, weapons and IEDs that were found in the city. Uh, we also found large uh, IED making facilities, uh, both the kind uh, that, that make uh, uh, the remotely controlled as well as the command detonated wire as well as uh, facilities for making uh, vehicle borne IEDs. So clearly uh, besides being a safe haven for uh, leadership and command and control, Fallujah uh, was a center for making the IEDs that were being produced and, and used in other parts of the country uh, to attack the coalition. <clears throat> and we continue to make significant finds in the city every day. Uh, in other parts of the city, uh, humanitarian assistance is being conducted. Uh, currently pr uh, focused by the Iraqi Security Forces and the uh, uh, the U.S. Marines and the soldiers uh, that are there handing out food and water. Uh, th this is not a humanitarian crisis. The number of folks that have come uh, out to get food and water have not been significant. Uh, we believe most of the, the uh, uh, innocent, uh, the families, uh, left the city before, uh, before the attack occurred. Uh, and we are going to continue to clear out the city and make sure it's safe before we actually allow large numbers of uh, humanitarian organizations into the city. And I can't tell you exactly when that's going to be, but we hope very, uh, very soon. But, but like I said, uh, the urgency is, uh, is there to do that, but there is not a crisis that we need the, the uh, NGOs in to respond to immediately. Um, we'll continue to pursue that as we move towards elections uh, in January, uh, and we can talk about the other parts of, of Iraq uh, uh, during the question and answer period. Looking over at Afghanistan, um, we, are, we are very uh, optimistic, I would say, uh, w with some guardedness only because uh, we're not sure what the uh, Taliban will do next. Uh, we think they suffered a very large defeat. Actually, we know they suffered a very large defeat. Uh, just by virtue of the fact that elections occurred and, um, and, and how they will re respond to that failure uh, remains to be seen, but we're concerned uh, that in the run-up to the uh, elections for the lower and upper house uh, currently scheduled for the spring, uh, that we'll, we, we will see a, uh, an increased level of violence uh, in an effort to try and stop those elections from, from occurring. Uh, I, I would... Uh, say as we look towards the Iraqi elections, I'd remind all of you all of the skepticism a year ago about the opportunity ever to have elections in Afghanistan. And uh, I think that uh, that bodes somewhat uh, well for the Iraqis uh, in that uh, we're seeing a similar level of interest in uh, elections and, and politics with the Iraqi people that we saw with the Afghans. Uh, you'll recall we, we didn't expect more than about 6 million people to register in Afghanistan. We ended up with uh, 10 and a half million uh, registered and almost 9 million uh, Afghan residents um, voted, of which about 40 percent were women, which would be unheard of and inconceivable uh, two or three years ago in Afghanistan. And they're proud of what they did. If you go talk to a, uh, an Afghani, uh, he will, she, he or she will show you uh, their registration card with their picture, their their thumbprint, and and they'll tell you that it's the first time in thousands of years that anybody's asked them their opinion on anything, and uh, and they gave it by going and voting. Uh, they waited in line, uh, oftentimes in uh, in snow up to their knees at three o'clock in the morning uh, to make this happen, and uh, we are hoping that that we at some point in time can generate the same level of uh, commitment uh, to this in Iraq that we had in Afghanistan. Although I will admit, given the uh, security situation there right now and the intimidation and harassment campaigns that are going on, uh, it, it will be difficult. But we're continuing to move down that road uh, towards elections in, in January and then looking to elections in Afghanistan in the spring. So that's a, a very small part of the AOR. As you know, we've got uh, 27 countries 
and our AOR stretching from the Sudan up to Kazakhstan and Syria and Lebanon. We tend to focus uh, on Iraq and Afghanistan when we're dealing with you all, but there, there are a lot of other things going on uh, in our, our area of responsibility. If you have any questions about those, uh, I'll be glad to answer any. Yes, sir. Sir, can you tell us the date for Iraqi elections? The, and the, the plan right now, uh, as I understand it from the Independent Election Commission of Iraq, is 27 January. I've also heard a date of 28 January, but I think the, the uh, more expected one is 27 January. And are you, what's your feeling on how widespread the voting can be given the insurgency? It's, uh, uh, we, we will see uh, as we go through the registration uh, period, uh, we'll have a better feel for that uh, in, in another month or so. Um, but, but we are seeing uh, a lot of interest in, in registration. Uh, there are some areas where we haven't been able to get the registration forms. Actually, one were uh, uh, Ramadi because of the situation, the, the most recent situation. But we expect to be able to get uh, registration forms there soon. Uh, but they have gone to all of the other registration centers in the other uh, 17 provinces, and uh, and so uh, registration will will be the key to being able to tell uh, what response we'll get from them. But right now. It looks like it's uh, it's pretty positive, uh, in that uh, in that they are registering, and uh, and they're moving forward. And it would go ahead nationwide, or it would nationwide. We we uh, we are intent on trying to provide a secure and stable enough situation to be able to conduct nationwide elections in January. And I, I will not pretend that that's not a challenge at this stage, but uh, we will continue along those lines. Yes, sir. General, along those same lines, uh, yesterday when you were at the Foreign Press Center, you said that uh, we will make adjustments to our troop strength as elections approach, and you said that this would not amount to a huge increase in troops. Yes, sir. I wonder if you could define that a little bit. Are you talking mainly about extending some units? We are talking mainly about extending some units. And uh, you'll recall in, uh, in Afghanistan we did bring some additional forces over. Uh, but a little bit different situation because we have a, a very uh, small number of forces to begin with uh, in Afghanistan. And so we, we, uh, we will make further assessment uh, as we get a little bit closer and as we understand what the impact of Fallujah is on the uh, entire country. Uh, but right now we have 18 brigades worth of uh, forces over there. Uh, we will expect by using uh, extensions uh, of some some troops that uh, were only planning on being over there for 10 months, expending, extending them another two months so that they still uh, would be on the ground, you know, about a year, uh, and using that to add additional forces over there. The, the issue, by the way, is not just uh, num <coughs> numbers, excuse me. Uh, the issue is really about exter experienced troops during this period of time of expected increased violence. Roughly 20 brigades in instead of 18. I'd say we, we, we are looking at, at somewhere between 18 and 19. Uh, you know, it's always difficult. Well, it's always difficult to, to do that because uh, when we count in brigades, we count two Marine expeditionary units as, a, as brigades and stuff. So uh, probably an additional brigade's worth of, of, uh, of, of forces. But we have not finalized that, and nor have we gotten approval through the Secretary of Defense to uh, to do some of the things that we are anticipating. Right, thanks. Would yes, troops sir? be kept in country beyond a year because of this? I'm sure there are a number who have that question. That would this. not be our intent, but it, but I would not say categorically that uh, that, that would be precluded. Uh, if, if we believe the security situation uh, requires that, we will uh, make appropriate recommendation to the Secretary and, and, uh, and through our leadership channels. Yes, sir. So you're talking about having uh, a troop level of approximately maybe 145,000 compared to what we have now? Uh, difficult to say. We've got about 138,000 right now, I think. And, and I think, uh, you know, something in excess of that, uh, wh whether it would be uh, 145,000 or 141,000 or what, I, I really uh, can't tell you until we get final decisions on, on what we will be allowed to do. Have you also ruled out the possibility of having uh, – uh, like in Afghanistan where they brought in 1,100 uh, we, we have not, airborne. Have you, uh, we have ruled? not ruled that out. We have not ruled out using our uh, strategic reserve forces, nor have we ruled out uh, calling in for our uh, division-ready brigade or a, a force within that. 
but again, I think too early to uh, to to try and decide that until we really see what's happening with the uh, uh, after in the aftermath of Fallujah. Yes, ma'am. Um, post Fallujah, now can you give us a more thorough assessment of how you see the insurgency across Iraq? What the impact of Fallujah has been on the insurgency, especially since the belief, I guess, was much of the insurgency in Fallujah was jihadist, Zarqawi uh, loyalists, and you have said in the past you believe in other parts of the country it's more former regime loyalists. Walk us across. Well, let me Iraq. let me try and characterize what we really thought was uh, was in Fallujah and what what Fallujah was being uh, used for. Uh, clearly, it was a safe haven for uh, Zarqawi and and his uh, his group. Um, which was not, by the way, all foreign fighters. There was some element of, of uh, Zarqawi's outfit that were foreign fighters, but also a number that, that were Iraqis, and he intentionally recruited Iraqis so he would have a, a more significant voice within, uh, within Iraq. Uh, but, but Fallujah was also the center of uh, the former regime element effort uh, to destabilize uh, Iraq. Uh, that, that, as you know, uh, was always been a, uh, a stronghold of, uh, of Ba'athist uh, activism. Um, and, and these IED factories and, and, uh, and those sorts of things are, are not what we would say were necessarily part of the Zarqawi network, but more related to the former regime uh, elements. And so uh, this also operated as a command and control uh, facility, and we have seen, seen that within the city. Uh, where uh, they built these IEDs, they, uh, uh, they they had fighters, they had pretty pretty good freedom of movement, and from Fallujah they would uh, stage out and go into other cities and other areas uh, to attack uh, not just coalition forces but attack Iraqis, and um, and so we believe the impact of Fallujah is to have taken away a very significant safe haven. Uh, to have uh, uh, taken away their ability uh, to uh, command and control from a central location. Uh, that's not to say that, uh, that, that they still uh, can't work some level of coordination, but, but we've taken their command center away. And we have killed a lot of, uh, a lot of insurgents, uh, some terrorists of the Zarqawi, uh, too early to tell, but uh, certainly a, a very large number of uh, former regime element uh, types. Uh, and, and, you know, we will always, we will debate the numbers for a while as to what they really mean. But if, if uh, you know, oftentimes if, uh, if we, if the Marines say that they've killed uh, 1,200 to 1,600 folks, you, you, you know, that's what they think. And, and oftentimes you find out that the wounded are considerably larger than that and the number killed uh, are larger than that just because we're very conservative in our estimations. So do you agree with General Sattler yesterday when he said the back of the insurgency is broken? I, I uh, General Sattler is a, a great commander and he is focused on, uh, on Fallujah and uh, did uh, spectacular things in there. Uh, I think it's too early for me to say, uh, given the, the broad perspective of Iraq, that the, uh, that the backbone of the insurgency is broken. We have certainly uh, had a significant impact on the insurgency. Uh, but we know uh, that the important part is going to be to follow on with this success and not allow a safe haven to exist anyplace else like Ramadi uh, or Bakaba or some of those other cities where we know uh, these folks go. Yes, sir. General, uh, today we saw the leader of a Sunni mosque in Baghdad taking in a bit of a firefight there. Um, is this the start of uh, an approach to uh, go against uh, the people who are inciting violence and uh, speaking out against the coalition uh, to, to really more directly deal with these people? I would say, uh, you know, we have always had, even, even under the CPA, before the turnover of sovereignty, had a certain level of freedom to do that that oftentimes we, we didn't, uh, didn't exercise. I'm talking about the imams and the clerics that, that are out there uh, really condoning violence and encouraging uh, violence against the coalition. Um, I think this, uh, the leadership, uh, Prime Minister Alawi, uh, President Yawir, and the, uh, the other members of, of that leadership uh, are prepared to be more aggressive against those that are intent on, uh, on inciting uh, 
wh whatever it is that they're trying to incite. But but the jihadist violence part uh, that is really uh, the words they use often uh, are aimed at the coalition, but the results of what they're doing are often against the Iraqi people, not the not the coalition. When when you look at the number killed. And if I could take you out of Iraq for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, in the hunt for bin Laden along the Afghan-Pakistan border, and your assessment of al-Qaeda as an organization, its ability uh, from the top to communicate with the uh, terrorists elsewhere. Uh, we've, we've had uh, some good discussions on that today. I spent the afternoon out at, uh, out at Langley, and uh, I, I would say, uh, as I mentioned yesterday in the, uh, uh, in the, in the press briefing, that uh, that, that we are in pretty reasonable agreement that uh, it is very, very difficult for bin Laden and Zawahiri and, and his other elements, uh, Faraj, Abu Layth, uh, 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 Hadi al-Iraqi and, and, uh, and, and that group, um, to operate uh, efficiently and effective, effectively with a command and control structure. Uh, hence, you end up using uh, very slow means of trying to communicate. Uh, whether it's couriers that carry uh, compact disks, uh, you know, from Pakistan or Afghanistan through Iran or through other countries to uh, to Zarqawi, uh, or whether it's uh, uh, the use of, of television and other things to try and get the word out, uh, I think it is very, very difficult for them to operate uh, efficiently and effectively. I think that's one of the reasons why we've we focused our attention more recently on, on Zarqawi, because of his location and his ability to uh, coordinate his efforts, he, he has had a pretty significant uh, effect on, on our operations. Do you think there's communication between Zarqawi and bin Laden? I think there are attempted communications between Zarqawi and bin Laden. Whether or not they've been successful uh, because of the uh, huge distances involved in those lines of communication, uh, I would say that they probably have not been. But we know uh, for a fact that there are attempted communications uh, between them and uh, and they would have to to be conducted over the kinds of uh, lines that I just described. Well, in fact, sir, what you just said was attempted, before you said that, you were talking about couriers carrying CDs from Osama bin Laden to Zarqawi. I shouldn't say Osama bin Laden, but I would certainly say al-Qaeda senior leadership. So you believe the, com the attempted communication has been Al-Qaeda senior leadership to Zarqawi, <coughs> as well as Zarqawi to bin Laden, but you are saying you believe Al-Qaeda senior leadership has attempted to communicate to I, Zarqawi? I believe, and, and, and I don't have anything uh, absolutely firm in, in, uh, uh, in a multiple source intelligence report or anything that can say these two guys are trying to communicate. Uh, but, but we do have indications that we believe they are uh, trying to communicate. Uh, and whether it is to congratulate him on, on having announced that he wants to be part of al-Qaeda uh, or whether it's to communicate and give him instructions or what it is, we, we don't know. But uh, we do believe uh, that through the process that, uh, that they are trying to communicate. Do you believe Zarqawi is still in Iraq? Uh, I believe, I personally believe that Zarqawi is still in Iraq. Yes, ma'am. General, what kinds of specific information has the U.S. military gleaned from the computers and documents yeah, seized at this alleged uh, Zarqawi command center? Uh, I can't tell you right now. It's not because I, I won't tell you. Um, it's because I don't know. Uh, we will go through the whole sensitive site exploitation uh, business within Iraq. Uh, initial indications are that it is a fairly significant treasure trove of information. But until you actually uh, get in there and look at the papers, you'll recall uh, after we got Saddam, uh, you know, we didn't really know what we got. And then when we examined the pocket litter and some of the other stuff that was out there, there was a, a certain amount of information that was very useful to us. So we would expect the same. To yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you uh, uh, perhaps, I realize you're still going through that, but perhaps talk about what you think of command and control among the insurgents? I mean, there. We had this, uh, these events in Fallujah and the simultaneous uh, breakouts in other cities. Yeah. Is this centrally commanded? Is it just random? Uh, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't so much as, as say it's, uh, it's random, and I wouldn't call it uh, a command and control set either. I think it is uh, more or less broad guidance that says, okay, if they attack Fallujah, then 
uh, than, and I think we saw some of that in, in Zarqawi's uh, minute-long uh, take. If they attack uh, Fallujah, uh, then we're going to, uh, you know, attack lines of communication, logistics supply into the area, infrastructure, and, and, and the like. And, and then that, uh, in turn, goes out and, uh, and raises uh, the level of violence all across. It, it is also uh, evident from the early days, uh, I can't think of it specifically, but, but you'll recall uh, uh, some of the, well, actually it was in April during the Fallujah, uh, the last Fallujah event, you saw some fairly significant events elsewhere in the country, perhaps to relieve the pressure on Fallujah, but, but also it, it was, uh, they, they gained some level of confidence because of the stand and the resistance that was in there. And, and it's that confidence that allowed them to go out and, and take action. So that, that's, I, I would not give them credit uh, for a, a robust command and control system, but I would say uh, that there is a certain level of, uh, of talking. I, I want to go back to this uh, senior leaders from Al-Qaeda and Zarqawi. Uh -huh. and make sure you are saying what you aren't saying. Are you suggesting that there could be some Al-Qaeda uh, control, direction, guidance, of the Iraqi insurgency? I'm saying that there is a relationship between Al-Qaeda senior leadership and Zarqawi. How to characterize that, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but you'll recall that, uh, that when we captured uh, one of the individuals that uh, was trying to uh, go back uh, to uh, Pakistan or wherever, uh, or Afghanistan, wherever uh, Al-Qaeda senior leadership was at the time, uh, that that, that uh, CD was characterized as uh, an attempt to communicate uh, between Zarqawi and, uh, and Al-Qaeda. We think that is, those attempts are still continuing. And when he uh, made the announcement that he was a part of Al-Qaeda or, or a franchise element of Al-Qaeda, uh, we, we are clearly uh, thinking that that kind of link uh, and communications will, will, there will be attempts to continue that. But I don't have evidence that says so and so is walking across the border uh, today to try and communicate with Zarqawi. Well, is that a two way street, I guess. Yes, I'm yes sir. I, I think Zarqawi communicating with Al Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. I, I think, again, in a very difficult situation that they will try and communicate. Okay. Uh, but, I, but I cannot tell you right now that, uh, that Al Qaeda has said this is what we want you to do in Iraq. I don't think they do that anyway. Uh, we don't view al-Qaeda these days as being uh, a director of operations. Uh, or I, I, we don't uh, see al-Qaeda senior leadership as being a director of tactical level operations. We see them as offering a large vision and, and guidance out there that says uh, you all need to hold the course and, and, uh, uh, and attack the coalition and, and attack those members of the uh, uh, those infidels within the government and stuff. So I, I wouldn't characterize it as, uh, as giving guidance other than broad uh, philosophy. Yes, ma'am. General, a two-part question. Knowing what you know now about the situation in places like Mosul and Ramadi and Fallujah, what is your reasonable expectation about the likelihood that elections can be held in those cities? And number two, if they can't be held because of instability and lack of security, would the result of an election, in your view, be a legitimate result? The, the, uh, I would tell you that we are going to do everything in our power to try and make it possible to have elections in January. Um, I think it is, uh, and clearly, the Fallujah uh, attack was an effort uh, to try and make sure that, that we uh, we could establish some level of security without them having that safe haven. Uh, we will see how successful we, we were in that. I, I don't believe there will be another uh, safe haven, uh, but I will tell you that the intimidation campaign that is ongoing is very effective. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, we, we see it permeate uh, many levels of uh, uh, of the Iraqi government and the Iraqi security forces. Uh, you're seeing more of it daily as, uh, as we see decapitated bodies in, uh, in Mosul and other places. Um, and it's, it's that part that we have got to be able to, to handle and take that away from them 
so that people can freely get out uh, with some level of reasonable risk to uh, to vote and not go back and expect their families to be uh, to be killed uh, just because they they go out and vote. And there's going to take a certain level of courage on the part of the Iraqis. Uh, just like there was on the part of the Afghans, Afghanis to go do that. Um, the second part of my question, uh, if they can't vote there, would the results be legitimate in your view? Well, it's an interesting uh, uh, way that this voting is going to occur. You know, the, we, the, the various groups are going to submit voting lists uh, to try and pick the members of the, uh, of the National Assembly. And so uh, because a particular uh, city can't vote does not mean that uh, that their leaders and their their people will not be voted on by other people within uh, Iraq. In other words, there may be Sunnis on uh, Ayatollah Sistani's, Sistani's uh, election list uh, that would be voted upon uh, by the entire uh, entire country. And so it it could be that even without uh, say a city like Fallujah voting, uh, that there would be adequate representation. Uh, by the the uh, Sunnis uh, to feel or or look like it was uh, legitimate representation for all the parties involved, um, but but that is not our intent. Our intent clearly is to try and make it possible for everybody to vote uh, in Iraq that wants to vote, and uh, and that's going to take uh, a lot of effort between now and January to establish security for each of the polling places and, and all of the other things that we had to do in Afghanistan. Uh, and hopefully we'll have the Iraqi security forces uh, in uh, large enough numbers to be able to, uh, be, to be able to do that. Yes, sir. I have for a couple more here. Uh, General, it's, it's been three years from the September 11 attack, and uh, Al-Qaeda is still uh, working in the, in the Arab world, and in, especially in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Who do you think is still financing and supporting Al-Qaeda? And do you think is any regime in the area in the Gulf or, or in the Arab world is involved in this financing? I don't think that there is any regime in the Arab world that knowingly and intentionally uh, is financing Al-Qaeda. Uh, I think it's clear uh, that uh, those moderate uh, Arab regimes are very much at risk uh, themselves from the extremists. And if they didn't know that before, I think they clearly know that now. You need only look at Saudi Arabia and the uh, very important efforts that they're taking about against extremists in, in their uh, society. Uh, so I, I have not, uh, I, I don't characterize this as a fight uh, necessarily between Al Qaeda and, and the West, although it clearly characterizes that. This is also a very large fight within the uh, Muslim community of moderates versus extremists. So, so any regime that would, would take that on and, and support that, I think, puts them, themselves at risk, and I don't think any of them wish to do that. Uh, to follow up the question, do you have any information about there is some uh, movement in, in, inside the royal family in Saudi Arabia who is still supporting Al-Qaeda? I, I don't have any direct information uh, along those lines, although I know the, the, the Crown Prince Abdullah uh, has a very large challenge on his hands to make sure that the entire ruling family and the other leadership of Saudi Arabia uh, is all of the same mind in the actions he's taking against, uh, against the extremists. Yes, sir. Let, me, let me ask you about another uh, uh, country in your area, and that's Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in the news this week. Uh, based on the intelligence, the evidence that you look at, um, what is the intent and the capability of Iran to produce a nuclear bomb right now? And 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 how far are they along in developing the missiles to, to deliver those? Yeah, I, you've exceeded my technical knowledge on on this stuff. I mean, actually, I do go in and ask questions to try and explain. I, I, my last tour was in Korea, so I have a pretty good understanding of uh, highly enriched uranium and, and what, where you need to go to, to be able to develop a bomb. But it, it also involves a certain amount of miniaturization and the ability to make something small enough to fit on a, uh, on a warhead. Uh, clearly, uh, the AK Khan uh, efforts uh, shared information with Iran uh, that I think is available to them and was available to them. Uh, the, the question is how far down the road of highly enriched uranium did they get and how far are they prepared to go? 
because I think, as, as you know, or at least as I've learned, there, there is a peaceful use for enriched uranium uh, to efficiently use it in, in the nuclear plants. I can't tell you, just like I don't think uh, anybody can categorically uh, say, although there is, uh, there is growing evidence uh, that, that gives us some cause for concern, but I certainly can't say categorically uh, that, that they have gone to the point of highly enriching uranium to be able to put it on, a, on the head of a missile. Now, at the same time, we see a fair amount of uh, missile development going on, uh, looking at extended ranges uh, from missiles that we know have the capability uh, to carry uh, nuclear warheads and chemical warheads and the like. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the insurgent leaders uh, who left Fallujah and, and other insurgents who left Fallujah, where do they appear to be setting up now? And one of, one of the places where there was most intense uh, fighting other than Fallujah during that period was Mosul. Can you explain a little bit what's, what's sure going on there? First of all, I'm, I'm not, I mean, there has been a characterization that, uh, that all of the insurgent leadership left, uh, uh, left Fallujah. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, now, I, certainly some did. Uh, I think uh, Zarqawi uh, sort of left his followers in the, uh, in the city to fight, and he booked. Um, that, that's what I think. Um, I, I don't have any proof that he's someplace else, but, but uh, we believe he, uh, he did leave the city. I'm not absolutely convinced that uh, Omar Hadid uh, or Sheikh Janabi uh, or the leader of, uh, I, I forget his name, of Muhammad's ar army, uh, that those very significant leaders within the insurgent community uh, either um, got out of the city, uh, survived the attacks, uh, or are not still in there fighting uh, with some of this uh, resistance. Uh, so I think it's going to take a, a while before we uh, can really say that the, uh, the, the leadership of the insurgent efforts uh, escaped uh, Fallujah. The, the others that, uh, that got out, uh, we clearly believe some of them went into Al Ramadi. It's close. Uh, there there are, uh, have been an increase in violence in Al Ramadi that indicates that uh, some folks slipped in there. Mosul is an interesting place. The, the, that, um, Mosul, uh, the, the, the events that occurred in Mosul do not have to have happened because people left Fallujah and went up there. There were, there were a fair amount of uh, people in Fallujah sufficient to be able to, uh, to create problems for us. As you know, uh, that is probably the largest area of, area of former regime general officers where they retired and, and, and live up there. So it, it has been a, a, always an area of concern uh, for us. And we had seen activity earlier out in Talafar, uh, and, and we've had an increasing level of activity in Mosul before Fallujah. So, opportunistic, uh, I would say, an, 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 again, an effort to relieve some of the pressure on, uh, on Fallujah and force us to, to move forces and consider Mosul. Now, that has always been characterized uh, incorrectly, in my view. We, we never lost Mosul. Uh, what happened was there were, there were a certain number of uh, police stations uh, where, when, uh, when approached, when attacked by a significant number of ACMs, uh, or anti-coalition military, that the, the police uh, either laid down their arms or, or, or left. In the, in the police stations where the, uh, uh, the police stood up and fought, uh, all of them held their own, and, and they maintained control of their police station and their, their part of the city. And then when the additional forces uh, went in there, restored uh, those, uh, those police stations that, uh, that had been overrun. So, uh, there, there's some 30, uh, 34 police stations in, uh, in Mosul. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how many were overrun, six or nine or, or something like that, and I wouldn't even characterize them necessarily as being overrun, uh, were occupied by, uh, by the bad guys in some cases because, uh, because the police weren't there. There are some other areas like Bakaba, uh, and, and clearly I think uh, Baghdad is always a place uh, where, where they can escape to in a city that large and find some level of, of sanctuary. But our intent, absolutely, is to keep the pressure on these guys and not allow them to create another Fallujah any place in Iraq. Just if I could just, if I could just confirmed follow up. kills 
in Fallujah? Yeah, terrorist uh, confirmed. The terrorist dead. leaders confirmed. Yeah, letter. I, I do not. We we have some indications, and you know we get uh, uh, indications from a lot of different sources uh, that that there have been some uh, members of the leadership that uh, either didn't make it out uh, or have been wounded uh, or may still be there uh, fighting to the end. Not everybody said, I'm out of here, you guys stick back and fight for me. Sir, can I clarify one thing on the, uh, the breaking of the back of the insurgency issue? What evidence would you have to see that's lacking today before you broadly would make the claim that the insurgency's back has been broken? I would say until we can get the intimidation campaign, uh, the widespread intimidation campaign under control, uh, when, when we see people freely uh, taking part in government, freely, uh, freely acting, and I don't mean every place, there's always going to be, you know, stopping intimidation is going to be a hard thing to do. And, and about the only way we can do that is to maintain an offensive position and go, go after these guys before they can do the kidnapping, before they can, uh, you know, kill the, the leadership and, and protect the leadership at the same time. Haven't you been doing that all along? We have been. And I think what's different is there's not a safe haven for them to operate out of uh, that, that, that they have freedom of movement. They are going to be under, if we, uh, if we are successful in what we plan, is they will be under the same kind of uh, pressure uh, that we've put the Al-Qaeda senior leadership under, and it's going to be much more difficult to uh, orchestrate the kind of things that they're doing right now. Thank you, John. Thank, you, John. Okay. Thank you very much.